So Bree, why don't you come on up, Bree? Bree's going to do some scripture reading for us. If you open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Bree's going to read verse 10 to 20 for us. So thank you, Bree. Finally, be strengthened in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Clothe yourselves with the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand your ground on the evil day and having done everything to stand. Stand firm, therefore, by fastening the belt of truth around your waist, by putting on the breastplate of righteousness, by fitting your feet with the preparation that comes from the good news of peace, and in all of this, by taking up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. With every prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And to this end, be alert with all perseverance and requests for all the saints. Pray for me also, that I may be given the message when I begin to speak, that I may confidently make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may be able to speak boldly as I ought to speak. Thank you, Bree. And parents, forgive me, I forgot to release children. So, um, kids, have a great time downstairs. I start working on my message Monday morning. And, um, and by Friday, I actually preach it to Teresa. She needs to hear it twice. <laughs> and, and she helps me with, with it. And, um, and we do it again Saturday sometimes. Well, I just wasn't happy with it yesterday. And so I woke up in the middle of the night this week and just went, up down, got down, went downstairs and didn't rewrite the whole thing, but I re-emphasized some of the things. So, so um, if I'm a little, a little halting in it, that's why. Because um, now I'm kind of just getting to know it again. But spiritual warfare. So here's some statistics. Not, in, a, in a survey by what's called the Pew Foundation, a group that surveys religious beliefs in America, 9% of Americans would say they are highly convinced or entirely convinced there is no God. Okay, you understand that? 9% of Americans would say they are highly convinced or entirely convinced there is no God. We would call them atheists, 9% of Americans. 24% of Americans would say they are highly convinced or entirely convinced there is no devil. Aren't those interesting numbers? that only 10% approximately of Americans would not believe in a personal God or any kind of God. But 24% of Americans would say there is no devil. Which is an interesting thing that a certain amount of people believe in a God or some kind of spiritual force out there, but deny, and, and usually they see it as good, but deny a personal devil as someone who is evil. So why is that? What has happened in our culture that we still want to hold on to this, this good God idea, but want to deny anything about a devil? And I would argue there's probably multiple reasons why. One of them is, is our, our, the concept of naturalism or materialism. That, that's a, philo- a philosophy that says all there is in the world is what we can physically see, touch, smell, hear, and taste. That's all there is. Well, clearly, God doesn't fit into that category, and Satan doesn't fit into that category. So our minds have been, even as Christians, our minds have been, been conditioned to not think of the spiritual world. And, and also, I think we don't want to think of evil, so we'll just put it out of our minds. So, so some people who don't believe in God or, or believe in Christ necessarily would want to deny the spiritual world of evil. And, and we can't do that. 
The other side, among the Christian community, I think sometimes we push the pendulum way too far and we see a demon under every bush. Blame everything on the devil. We have these concepts, I don't think biblical at all, that talks about the demon, the demon of anger, the demon of lust, the demon of whatever. And if you just cast that demon out of yourself or get it cast out, you won't have a problem with anger. You won't have a problem with lust anymore. As though the, the problem in our lives is demons. When in fact, it's our hearts. The devil knows that. So, so with that introduction, we want to look at Paul's admonition. Stand firm in the Lord, in the strength of his might. So I'm going to reread Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. Finally, be strengthened in the Lord and the strength of his might. Clothe yourself with the full armor of God. This is, the, this is the New English translation, by the way. Usually I use the New American Standard, but today this is called the NET, the New English Translation. I wanted to use it because I like the wording of it better. Clothe yourself with the full armor of God so you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces. Oops, got to turn the page. Against the world rulers of this dark darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so you may be able to stand your ground on that evil day. And having done everything to stand, then it says stand firm. Three times it tells us to stand. Stand firm. Interesting, Ephesians, um, ever heard of Watchman Nee? Anybody ever heard of Watchman Nee? Watchman Nee was a Chinese um, pastor and, and scholar from 100 years ago. And on his book on Ephesians, he had three words he described Ephesians. Sit, walk, stand. Sit, walk, stand. He took sit from Ephesians chapter 2, that when Christ died, we died with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. When he rose, we rose with him. And he sat at the right hand of God where we sit with him right now. In our position in Christ, we are sitting with Jesus Christ at the right hand of God. We are secure in Christ. Everyone say amen. amen. Or you can say hallelujah. <laughs> then sit, walk. About nine times in the book of Ephesians, Paul says walk, walk. And it's the imagery of live your life to the glory of God. Walk in love. Walk in unity. All those things. Walk worthy of your calling. So that, that's the middle of Ephesians. You get to the end here, kind of the, the crescendo of the book of Ephesians, and it's stand. Sit, walk, stand. And the imagery here is of um, standing against forces that are coming at you, leaning into them, and not giving into them. So that's what we're going to look at today. Three times he says to stand and to put on the full armor of God. So why do we do this? The reason because we have an enemy. Hopefully we're not part of the 24%. Hopefully we're part of the 76%. But listen to what the Bible says about this enemy. We are in a battle because we have an enemy. Here Paul calls him the devil. Other places in the Bible he's called many things. Satan, which means the adversary. He is the serpent from Genesis. And he is called the dragon in the book of Revelation. He is known as the deceiver, a liar. In fact, Jesus says he is the father of lies, but he can appear as an angel of light. He is known as the tempter, the ruler of demons, the evil one, the enemy, a murderer. He is called the ruler of this world, the God of this age, the accuser of God's people, and the deceiver of the whole world. Those are just some of the descriptions in the Bible of our enemy. And not just him, but we have a whole, he has a whole array of what's called the demonic forces, the rulers and principalities and powers of, of, the, of the spiritual world. That's our enemy. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, 9. This is, this is very foundational to what I'm saying today. Peter says, stay alert. That's, that's his way of saying stand. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him. Same word Paul used. Stand firm against him. Be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the exact same kind of suffering as you are. You see, Peter's writing to a group that are suffering. They're being persecuted. And Paul, Peter is actually saying at the heart of this persecution, at the heart of this is the devil. And he's looking for someone to devour. An incredible imagery. A lion looking for someone to devour. I mentioned before that sometimes Christians see a demon under every bush. 
Here's what you have to grasp. And that is that the book of Ephesians makes it very clear. You used to belong to his kingdom. Ephesians chapter 2 says you were dead in your sins and your trespasses in which you formerly walked, you formerly lived. You were under the prince of the power of the air. He was your ruler. But God, being rich in mercy and the great love with which he loved us, this is Ephesians 2 verse 5, but God, being rich in mercy, the great love with which he loved us, delivered us from death and made us alive. He transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. We don't belong to Satan anymore. And, and so too often Christians live in fear Satan's going to get them. And I'm going to develop today an idea that the only way Satan can have any influence in your life is, as far as in temptation and things like that is because you give it to him. Because God has removed you from it. You don't belong to him anymore. So understand who you are in Christ. I, I, I once lived in, in Winnemucca. Um, six years I was out in the desert, literally. You ever been to Winnemucca, anybody? Um, it, was not, it was a good time, but I was so glad when I left. Um, and I rented this house, and it had a basement, and it turns out it had a secret room in the basement. In the secret room, it was a rock wall, and, and, the, and the door was part of the rock wall that, that swung open. And it was a room about 12 by 12, and the walls were pitch black, the floor and the ceiling were blood red, and on the floor was a pentagram. The previous resident used to get mail. I asked the mailman about this. The previous resident used to get mail to the wizard. So he was a Satan worshiper, and that's where he had whatever it is he did. Um, kept my dog in there. So, um, um, but I, I had friends who came to my house, and unfortunately, I probably treated it too lightly, honestly. But I had friends who came to my house. I would show it to them. They would never come back. Their fear was they'd be demon-possessed if they came into my house. As though Satan can just possess you whenever he wants. Now, I, I don't want to make light of the devil. He is our enemy. He's powerful. But he doesn't own us anymore. And, the, and when we're looking at today the armor of God, our goal is to look at this armor. This armor isn't about fighting the devil. This armor is about pursuing the Lord Jesus Christ and his Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and when we pursue God through this armor we're going to talk about, then the devil has nothing in us. Okay? Um, there's, different kinds of, um, there's different kinds in the Bible of, of spiritual warfare. There's what's called a power encounter. A power encounter you see in the Gospels, in the book of Acts with the apostles, as they cast demons out of people. They come across someone who's demon-possessed, and the demon possession is usually very overt. Something desperately wrong with this person. And, and Jesus or the apostles cast the demons out. That's called a power encounter. But when you get to the epistles, you, you don't see that anymore. Not, not that it's not true, it doesn't happen, it does. But the emphasis of the epistles in, in, in the New Testament is what's called truth encounter. That you have a warfare where you stand against the evil one by means of truth. That's why it's the first armor we put on. So let's talk about that now as we go. Um, Let's survey Ephesians 6 to 14 pretty much for the rest of the sermon. By the way, it's a two-part sermon. We're going to go through verse 16 today, and then Pastor Ron's going to pick up verse 17 and take it through the end of verse 20 that Bree read to us about prayer. So, the means by which we stand strong is the armor of God. We're commanded to stand strong in the strength of his might. The means by which we do that is by the armor of God. I want to show you an illustration because here's what happens. Go ahead put that up there, Edie. This is obviously a reenactment of a Roman garrison. And they have their shields. So underneath that, they're all in their full armor that we're going to talk about. They have these shields. These shields are four foot tall, about two and a half feet wide. And, and too often, the reason I'm showing you this, and we're going to talk about it more later, is too often we see as spiritual warfare as me, the armor against the devil, with God's help. But this shows you how the Roman soldiers that Paul is seeing. Paul is, Paul's in prison when he writes this. Paul's also borrowing from the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, talks about the armor. So Paul's borrowing Old Testament imagery. He's in prison. He sees Roman guards every day. He lives in the Roman world. He has seen the soldiers. So he's borrowing from the Old Testament imagery in Isaiah and from the world he lives in to describe spiritual warfare. And, and because of our American individualism, I think we think it's me and Jesus against the devil. And well, yes, we each individually have to put on the armor. But it's really us and Jesus. We must think corporately about this armor. 
There is individual application, but think corporately. And we'll come back to this image in a little bit. So, with that, stand, verse 14, stand by fastening the belt of truth around your waist. Okay? Now, our translations, most of our translations say the belt of truth because, gentlemen, you wake up in the morning, let's not get too vivid, you put your pants on, and then what do you do? You tighten your belt. Well, guess what? The Roman soldiers didn't have pants and belts. In fact, the Greek text doesn't even mention a belt. See, the Romans wore more... Where's Neil? What do you call those Scottish things, Neil? Kilts, yes. So they, they wore more of a... I don't want to call them a skirt. This is a Roman soldier. You don't call a Roman soldier wearing a skirt. But whatever it was, a tunic, it, it was loose, hanging. So what the Greek text says, gird up your loins. It doesn't say put your belt on. But since we don't have tunics... The New American Standard says, gird up your loins, but we kind of go, what the heck's that mean? So more modern translations say, put on a belt. It's the idea of tightening up, of tightening up your, the garments on your lower body so that you can move and have flexibility in the battle. So gird up, so they would tie it up. And some even say by tying it up, it also secured the sword that it was hanging on their, their waist. So gird up your loins, put on the belt of truth, so the, the thing here is not so much the imagery of the armor, belt, or, or gird up your loins. It is the idea of truth. Satan, Sheila mentioned this during the worship, Satan is a liar. Jesus says this. He says, whenever, this is Jesus. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Why is he called the father of lies? Because in Genesis chapter 3, he said to Eve, surely you won't die if you eat from that tree. What did God say to him? Surely you will die if you eat from that tree. So Satan came along and said, surely you won't die. And then he goes even further. Basically implies God is holding something good back from you. You see, in his lies, this is where he's the tempter. He's a deceiver. In his lies... And always remember this. Deception is subtle. No one just wakes up one day and says, oh, I'm going to rob a bank. Anyone who goes that far in their evil has, has suddenly gone through multiple steps of deception to the point where, where they finally do something that a year ago they never would have thought of doing. Because deception is subtle. It's subtle. There's always a little truth with the lie. So the devil is a liar. We must put on the belt of truth. Jesus says in that same chapter, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Lies imprison you, truth liberates. So, if, if the belt of truth is this idea of pursuing God, who is the truth, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If pursuing truth is a way we battle the demonic realm in the world that's trying to upset our lives in faith, I ask you, what lies are you believing? Everyone believes lies. Most of our behavior, maybe all of it, I don't know, I'm not a psychologist, but much of our behavior is based upon our belief system. What you believe about God then drives how you behave. What you believe about yourself drives how you behave. What you believe about others. So what lies are you believing about God, about yourself, and about the person next to you, your spouse, your family, your friends. Because we have to believe truth about that. And in my counseling, that is at the heart of my counseling. Let's talk about what lies you might be believing. Because you act upon lies. Then lies bring destruction ultimately. So let me talk about a few of the lies that I think that we believe. And when it comes to, what I want to focus on, because we could take this so many places, you guys. We could take it so many applications. I want to focus on our, our daily behavior in the world, in our families, at our jobs, um, in our entertainment. Is our behavior honoring to God? Is it honoring to one another? Are you being respectful to yourself in your behavior? So I want to think about your behavior now as regards to lies you might believe. Here's a lie you might believe. Since I am saved by grace through faith, it doesn't matter if I sin. I'm already saved. I can just ask for forgiveness. I hope no one ever says that out loud. But I think people think that. That, you know, I'm saved. I said the prayer back and whenever I said it. It was an event in the past. 
So however I live now doesn't matter because I, I got my life insurance. That's a lie. That's a lie. And I don't have time. I look forward to the day I can teach a, a, um, a sermon on what's called perseverance of the saints. How you can know you are saved. At the heart of how you know you are saved isn't a prayer in the past. That's part of it. It is are you keeping the faith today? And what's proof you're keeping the faith today? John 15 says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And so proof you know Jesus, proof you understand who you are before God, what he's done for you, is a life given to obedience. So when we believe this lie, well, I'm saved, I can do whatever I want and just ask forgiveness later, is, is from the pit of hell. The devil's got you. He has deceived you into believing that falsehood. Here's another one, similar. I, I used to believe this. I don't really have the power to overcome sin, so I just need to sin and ask forgiveness later. Okay? And this is the teaching of the church, and, and, and certain aspects of the church put so much emphasis on our sin nature that we are, it's called total depravity, that sin has permeated every part of my being as a human being. And, and so I'm saved by grace, so I'm saved, but I still all of a sudden believe this lie, I'm still simply a sinner. When in fact the scripture says, no, you're a holy one of God. It says he's changed your heart. He's given you a new heart, a new nature. He's put his Holy Spirit within you. And so to sit there and say that I, I can't help but sin, it's too powerful for me, is to simply deny what God's already told us. Let me read to you what God's told you about temptation in your life. And, and all this applies to me too. I'm not simply pointing the finger. It applies to me. Because I used to hold to this. It used to frustrate me so much that God would say, be ye holy for I am holy. And I wasn't because I didn't think I could be. And then this reality hit me, and it's, it's summarized in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It's not on the screen, just listen. Paul says, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. No temptation is too strong for you. So whenever you have that belief, oh, this is overwhelming, I cannot resist it, you believe in a lie. That's a lie. And I used to live that way. I used to live that way in defeat um, because I didn't grasp who I was in Christ, the new nature that God has made me to be like Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit in me. So if you're in that way today, um, I need you, to, I need you to, to read Romans 6 over and over and over again. Seven times in the sixth chapter of Romans, in one way or another, it says that sin is not your master anymore. You don't have to obey it. I'm not talking perfection here. We will fight it our whole lives. But every time that thing calls, called sin and temptation, like think of a Mack truck coming at you down the highway. This massive truck going to run you over. Every time it comes, you have the power to step out of the way. You do not have to get run over by it. So one more lie. I'm the only one who has this problem, so I better keep quiet about it. And, and so I want to speak to gentlemen real quick. Um, sexual sin, pornography. It, it, it's rampant in our culture. It's rampant in this room. Um, it's something I fight all the time. I always have to keep my mind pure. I talk to my wife about it. I keep my mind pure. Stay away from certain things. Stay away from them. And sometimes, because of the shame of it, you don't want to talk about it. I'm the only one that has this problem. What did Paul just say? No temptation was overtaking you except as is common to man. Everyone has the same problem. It manifests itself differently, but never believe the lie you're alone. Back to that imagery, you don't got to put it up, Edie, but the, you don't have to, but the imagery of, of the the garrison, that the way we gain strength is to realize we're all the same. And we need to have the times of, James chapter five says, confess your sins to one another. N not, not as a priest who forgives me, but as a brother, in, in the case of, of men, our issues, a brother who understands, and I get power from confessing it, and a power from reminded I'm forgiven by God, and a power that has an arm around me that says, we'll fight this together. 
So ladies, I don't want to address your issues, but maybe I could. Um, what are they? Don't get me in trouble here. Jealousy, jealousy. I think, I think maybe ladies more than men compare themselves to other ladies. We men, we just don't care. Um, and so sometimes I think maybe that comparison grabs you and it controls you. That you don't have what so-and-so has. You don't look like so-and-so looks. You, you know? And, 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 and it's, it's a horrible trap to be caught in. The comparison game. So you're not alone. Okay. Next one. Stand firm by putting on the breastplate of righteousness. So righteousness can be two things in, in scripture. It can be what's called positional righteousness. That comes from 2 Corinthians 5.21. There Paul says this. He says that he who knew no sin, Jesus Christ, he knew no sin, became sin that you might become the righteousness of God in Christ. What they're saying is there's a transfer. Your sin was given to Jesus. He died on the cross for it. His righteousness was given to you. That's why you sit with him in the heavenly places right now. Because you are righteous before God. So I don't feel righteous. I don't act righteous. But there's a sense in the plan of God where you've been given the righteousness of Christ. Is that the breastplate? Imagine a breastplate now is a metal plate that you would wear. Okay, that would protect. the, 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 In fact, the, the breastplate, the word for that is thorax in Greek, which is the medical term for this area of the body. And, and so it protects, the, it protects the vital organs, righteousness does. Is it positional righteousness? I need to know who I am in Christ so the devil can't lie to me and tell me I'm not in Christ, I'm not secure? Well, maybe so. But also there's acts of righteousness. And that seems to be the focus of Ephesians. Earlier in Ephesians, there was this verse. Paul says this, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Transfer of kingdoms. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light, that is, what comes out of a person of light? These kind of deeds do. The fruit of light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So yes, the armor of God is certainly our positional righteousness in Christ, who God has made me to be by no effort of my own. But now that he has made me righteous, given his Holy Spirit to me, he says, now live it. Let the fruit of your life be goodness and righteousness and truth. And so deeds of righteousness, Paul has gone through them he spent two chapters on this. He said, stop lying, but what? Speak the truth. Stop stealing, but use your hands to help somebody and do good things for them. Quit using foul language, but use edifying speech in front of one another. He goes back and forth, all through Ephesians on this. And so those are deeds of righteousness, speaking truth, doing good deeds for one another, um, telling the truth, not lying. Those are deeds of righteousness. But then here's what he says. In that same passage, he says, you can be angry, but don't sin in your anger. And don't let the sun go down on your anger and give the devil a place. The literal word is give the devil a place. One translation calls it a foothold, which is a neat imagery. Imagine you're walking along and you've seen it in movies. You know, walking along and something right out of the sand grabs your hand, your foot. Okay, all of a sudden, now the devil has your foot. The only reason he has the right to grab your foot is because of your own controlled anger, according to that passage. So in the pursuit of God through the fruit, through the, the armor, truth and righteousness, as we pursue him, the devil has no place in us. But we decide to pull down that breastplate of righteousness and choose to walk into sin you now give the devil in the demonic realm a place in your life. I'm not talking about possession because I don't believe you can be possessed as a Christian. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Kim, say amen. amen. Okay, so, but you give him a place. You give him authority and power in your life. God saved you to take you out of that authority and by sinning, we give it right back to him. So the, the, the armor, the breastplate of righteousness The next one, stand firm by fitting your feet with the preparation that comes from the good news of peace. So now, now in this case, we've seen the pictures um, uh, you know, of Roman soldiers, and they kind of have a sandal that, that laces up around their, their leg so it can be on tight, doesn't slip off. And they also would have um, metal spikes or nails in the bottom, like cleats, that would allow them to stand 
So, so when they get in that formation, when they get that formation, they have to be able to, to not be pushed backwards. So those feet are prepared to stand. But the imagery here is to proclaim the gospel of peace. So there's a lot of that we could talk about here, but I want to talk about peace for a moment. I want to talk about peace. Is it the peace of God or peace with God? Do you hear the difference? Peace with God means you're no longer his enemy. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 10, talk about that. It says, you, you used to be enemies, but now you are not. We are no longer the enemy of God. So peace, I gotta be able to see you, Brad, so I'm gonna do that, if I'm talking to you, Brad. So, <laughs> peace, I was at enmity with God, I was his enemy, and he sent his son on the cross to die for his enemy, that's the point of Romans 5, 6 through 10. He sent his son to die for his enemies and make them his children. So that has to be part of that gospel message that we live in and proclaim. We are at peace with God. And, and given that it's Veterans Weekend, I am um, at Grace Church, you know, like any church, a lot of veterans. And oh, about 15, 18 years ago, this, this career Marine, he was a career Marine. He'd done two or three tours in Vietnam. He came up at one point where the pastor gave an altar call. And he came up to Pastor Dan, Dan Frank, the, the lead pastor at Grace, and said, um, I can't be forgiven. Well, why not? Because God could never forgive me for what I did in Vietnam. And, and Dan, I mean, this man is just, he's, he wants to be forgiven so bad. But he fully assumes he cannot have peace with God because of the evil he perceived, the, the things he did that he would call evil in Vietnam. And if you've been in war, or you've, you stood up here, if you've been at war, if you've been a police officer and you've shot somebody, I can't imagine, can't imagine the turmoil and psychological and mental turmoil there, can't imagine. But Dan assured him that Christ died to forgive all of your sins. Run to him. Be at peace with God. Then, oh, sometime later, after the Gulf, Gulf War started, a young man came to me. And he was a, again, a Marine. He was a sergeant in the Marine, and he had a platoon of men that, that he, he led. And they were being fired on by some of the people. This was in Iraq, being fired on. And those who were firing upon his men were behind women and children. And if he gave the order not to fire, because we are conditioned as American men to protect women and children, are we not men? If he gives the order to fire, women and children will be killed. If he doesn't, all his men will be killed. That's the cowardice of the enemy. He gave the order. None of his men were killed. The, the group of soldiers that were firing were killed, but so were women and children. And he understood, he grew up in a Christian home in our church. He understood that he had peace with God through the gospel, but he didn't have the peace of God. The peace of God is, is an emotional security. Listen to Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing. And that's all categories, whether it's little problems in my life that I can't sell my house in Reno and I really want to, or I told men to fire into a crowd in order to save the rest of the men. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, again, I don't know what it's like for this young man, and I'm sure it's something he has to do every waking day of his life. I'm sure his nightmares are controlled by it. But is the gospel of peace, if it's real, the devil wants to get in there and say, you don't have peace with God because you're such a miserable person. You've sinned against him so much. Or you've done this evil. God can never forgive you. The peace of God is never going to be yours. That's what he's going to whisper into our ear. By the way, just a little, this is my opinion. I don't believe Satan can read my mind. That's something I'm not, omniscient God can do. But I think he can put thoughts into my mind. I think there's some scriptural proof for that. I think he whispers things. Sometimes you ever have this kind of this thought, they go, where did that come from? 
Well, part of it is we're not fully redeemed. We need to redeem our minds. We knew it. And part of it, I think he's whispering lies into our minds. And I'm sure this gentleman has that whisper to him every day. And so he has to take these promises serious and put on that armor, I have peace with God, which will lead to me giving him all of my cares and concerns so I can have the peace of God. The last one we're going to talk about today. So let me back up. Vets in the room. If, if you're in a place where you wonder if whatever you had to do in the military or anyone else here that has, that, that has to do things that to keep people safe have to do things like killing people to protect them. Do you believe you're at peace with God through Jesus Christ? Do you believe that? You see, holding firm to that is the armor. Because of Christ, I am at peace with my God. And then do you have the peace of God? That emotional security that says, God's gonna make all things right someday, and so I'm gonna rest in him. I'd pray that if you don't have that, talk to me or one of your fellow um, vets. Talk to anybody who can help you with that. Don't live alone in that torture. If you're here today and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, you need to be at peace with God. Do you know that Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins? You had a debt you could not pay. You, you, don't, you, didn't, you don't have the resources to pay for your debt. So God, in his great love for you, had his son pay it. Took your sins and put them on his son. It's a, a very strange verse. He who knew no sin became sin. Not just carried it, became it. All of your sins, whatever you did, Jesus became that so that he could turn around and put his righteousness on you. And God asks you to turn to him in faith, which is the next armor, but to trust in Jesus and say, I, I give all my sin to you, God. I repent, forgive me. And he lavishes you with his love, grace, and righteousness. So the last armor, stand firm by taking up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Edie, if you could put that picture back up now. This formation, it's called the tortoise shell formation. T Teresa found this picture for me. It's called the tortoise shell formation because the, the way a, 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 um, a shell on a turtle protects it. When the turtle goes inside, it protects the turtle from enemies. And so when they had to approach an army, especially a wall, where rocks were being thrown, arrows were being shot, they would get in this formation. And it was incredibly powerful to break through enemy lines. And so this, this is the part about the shield of faith which we can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Think of the flaming arrows of the devil. Take the metaphor out of the way, the flaming arrows. What are the things he throws at you? He throws you temptations. Think of the ones that affect you. You don't gotta say them out loud. What are the temptations that you've given to time and time again? Those are the arrows of the evil one. You know, the doubts, the anger, the strife in your family. That all at some point is, is Satan, some level is enticing you to do that. Those are his arrows. The shield of faith protects you. So what is that faith? First, that faith, first, it is a simple trust in Jesus Christ. You must enter into this relationship where there's a point in time where everyone has to come to a place where they say, you know what, I can't do this anymore. And I sense God is knocking on my heart. So I turn to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I'm trusting in you. That's what faith is, a trust. It's simply not acknowledging something to be true, but it's putting all your trust in it. I trust you to save me. I can't save myself. I trust you, Jesus, to save me. And then there's this faith that you live in. Because if that faith is genuineness, then we could expand that to faithfulness. True faith results in faithfulness. And when we are faithful to the living God, just like that picture, if we do it, especially if we do it in community, there's a power where the evil one cannot get through that shield. When we as a group live in faith as we trust the Lord and then live in faithfulness to who he is. And, and we're going to be talking, in the next two weeks, we're going to deal with three more armor. The helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, and prayer. And we're going to wrap all this up because in the end... God didn't save you for you. Do you know that? He loves you. He loves you and me. 
But we're not the ultimate purpose of the cross. Do you know what the ultimate purpose of the cross is? The glory of God. He did it for his own honor and glory. He lavishes this upon us, makes us his children, so in the end, the God who deserves glory is glorified. He's commissioned us, though, to take this gospel of peace, the shield of faith, out to the world and tell them about the incredible blessings we have as his children, and they can too. So Ron's gonna pick that up next week, right there. The helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, and prayer. Let's pray together. Father, first of all, we come to you in thanksgiving for all you do for us, Lord, all you have done, you are doing and you will do. We are so grateful. Increase our gratefulness, Father. Open our eyes to what you do in our lives each day. And then, Father, remind us who we are as your children, who we used to be, and what you delivered us from and who we are now and the power you've given us to fight the evil one. And, and Lord, help us to focus on you, your son, and your spirit. And as we were praying this morning, Lord, upstairs, the thought that came to my mind, and I want to say that verse now that you gave us, Father, in that 2 Corinthians 13, 13, Father, where you said, the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That's what I pray for today, Father, that we would grasp the depths of your love and, and, and grasp it and feel it. Live in the grace of Jesus. Live in that grace that he has for us, Father. And have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. This amazing spirit of God who lives in each one of us, Lord. Our triune God, Father, Son, Spirit, we worship you and thank you. In Christ's name, amen.